Hello, um, this is our last lecture of the, uh, of the year. After this lecture, you're, you're done with the class. Um, I've pre-recorded it so that way, um, whoever subbing for me doesn't have to suffer through not knowing anything that they're talking about. This is a difficult class to, uh, sub for, so I wanted to make sure that they were covered. Um, I am recording this from home, so I do apologize if I have to, like, yell at my cat midway. She literally just jumped up onto my desk and, um, is going to be up in my face. This, uh, lecture is also going to be pretty long. It's probably going to go longer than your class. So, if you end up having to, um, you know, end class, feel free to pause and then just pick up again. Uh, for the next class, this should hopefully cover you for, for two classes of lecture. And then um, I have a little bit for, uh, of other material for you to work on otherwise. So here we are in Europe and America after 1945. Uh, the wor World War II is ending in 1945. So um, we are in kind of a rough state. Uh, World War II unleashed global devastation. Um, the U.S. dropped the atomic bombs, bombs in Japan in 1945, and um, the threat of nuclear war, so the Cold War, over the next century shifted the geopolitical climate drastically. Um, there was just persistent conflict throughout the world in the later 20th century, which led to widespread disruption and dislocation. Um, this conflict and unrest uh, honestly even remains today and um, can be seen in uh, contemporary art as well as the art of this time period. Um, the upheaval begins to characterize the culture sphere, cultural sphere following World War II, uh, leading to counterculture movements. So counterculture movements are um, what we today call uh, the, the hippie movements, uh, people who wanted to, um, you know, essentially drop out of society because they, it was no longer they so, something they wanted to be um, a part of. Um, there's this new spirit of rebellion, including the rejection of racism and sexism. People are becoming more consciously um, and socially aware. And um, identity is beginning to emerge at the forefront of uh, discussion culturally and artistically. Um, cool, I'll give you a little bit of time. If I ever pause, it's of course to give you time to um, take extra notes. And if you need to, feel free to pause the video. All right, so post-war expressionism in Europe. Uh, existentialism is the kind of main cultural philosophy right now. It's the philosophy asserting the absurdity of human existence and the impossibility of achieving certainty or conviction in life. Um, existentialists increasingly turn towards atheism, questions the possibility of um, situating God within a systematic philosophy. Um, and the belief was that if there is no God, a man is condemned to be free because once thrown into the world, he is responsible for everything he does. Um, so Sartre is the uh, main philosopher of the existentialist movement. <clears throat> and the uh, spirit of pessimism and despair is just prevalent, heavily prevalent throughout this, uh, throughout this movement. This particular piece here uh, is called Uneasy Life um, by Jean Dubuffet. And you can kind of see the spirit of pessimism and despair. <laughs> We've got some figures who are, oh, hey, here's my mouse, um, <laughs> hanging out. Uh, let's just lay in, laying on the ground over here. Uh, this is where these kind of insults that we talked about earlier of, of the, the childish, childishness come in. Um, so kind of expect to see some, some interesting stuff. And it's also where that, um, gestural abstraction that we were talking about, uh, came into play. Um, but that's just a bit later on. All right. So this is Alberto Giacometti. Uh, he's the, uh, a 
really kind of just a phenomenal uh, sculptor. If you ended up or do end up going to LACMA, the LA County Museum of Art, they have one of his um, sculptures and they're quite, they're quite interesting to see in person. Um, so Giacometti is um, heavily, heavily expresses the true spirit of existentialism. Um, he, his figures appear, they're, they're super, super skinny to kind of really give us the idea of, you know, the existence of space around the figure. Um, so that gives them the kind of alienated, solitary, and, um, and like lost in the world's immensity kind of feeling, vibe, look, um, his bronzes are the antithesis of other bronze statues. They lack solidity and mass. They're swallowed up by the space around them um, and conveying a sense of isolation and fragility. Um, so up until this point in history, bronze statues are essentially um, made, to, made to last and made to withstand. And um, that's kind of the idea of of bronze it's a sturdy material so he kind of um like swaps that he he flips it on its head he, he gets this wonderful juxtaposition between the um material and the subject matter um which is a fantastic way to kind of achieve what he's going for that's again that counterculture idea all right, Francis Bacon, um, very delightful. His images are always super delightful, and I and I say that with um, a, a bit of sarcasm. Not that I dislike them, but they're pretty grotesque most of the time, and and honestly, uh, scary. So, <clears throat> he used art as an attempt to remake the violence of reality itself, the brutality of fact. So um, he saw that the existence of life, um, you know, the, the realities of being a human as violent, as brutal, as, um, you know, filled with nothing but fear and despair. So, um, this, this piece is called painting. It's an, uh, indictment of humanity and a reflection of war's butchery. So again, this is, this is post-World War II. Um, so the, the political commentary, of course, is scathing. And um, he's recalling imagery that many Europeans and Americans would have seen on TV <clears throat> at this point in time. So he's got similarly dressed European and American officials. Um, and the central figure is uh, recalling particularly Neville, Neville Chamberlain with his umbrella. All right, abstract expressionism. Sorry if it seems to jump around a lot. I should have mentioned that um, just like in the uh, previous unit, um, the world is moving crazy fast and so art moves crazy fast and, and none of these, um, I haven't really included time periods on, on many of these because of the fact that it's it's all really just truly overlapping. So um, abstract expressionism is, is where we get into um, that wonderful Jackson Pollock that we're all pretty skeptical about. Um, so due to the devastation of World War II, the Western art world moved from Paris to New York in the 1940s. We talked about that uh, not too long ago. It was called the, the Armory Show and it absolutely shocked and almost horrified uh, most Americans because they weren't super familiar with the avant-garde and um, meanwhile American artists really ate it up. Um, it was the first major American avant-garde movement and um, these artists were turning inward to create. They uh, wanted their viewers to intuitively grasp the content of their art. They wanted their viewers to um, look at what it was and then intuitively be able to understand what the artist was intending when creating it. Um, it's, it's very lofty. 
it's very um it's very psychological it's very cerebral so um naturally it's not everybody's cup of tea um they there were two kind of bits in abstract uh expressionism it was split up into kind of two two areas so gestural abstraction which is expressiveness of energetically applied pigment and chromatic abstraction which is the focus on the color's emotional resonance all right jackson pollock he is the star of gestural abstraction um he didn't live too crazy long he uh died in a car accident at age 44 so um the kind of development of his artistic vision ended there um so through this technique that he developed himself he created art that was both spontaneous and choreographed he would kind of step out onto his canvas uh, and these canvases are gigantic by the way uh, this one uh, number one which is otherwise called lavender mist is um, seven foot three by nine foot ten so um, that's larger than life it's it's gigantic so he would take this uh, roll of canvas and and roll it right out onto his uh, floor and then take just giant buckets of paint and dip his fingers in it dip paint brushes dip dip all sorts of things and just sling it and so it had everything to do with his full body movement and he would just get lost in these paintings he would get uh almost entranced by this process and um each of his paintings uh contain remnants of of him as a person fingerprints uh footprints cigarette ashes so um it's in a way almost kind of a living piece of art um, he had interest in ideas about improvisations in the creative process that are probably linked to his interest in Carl Jung um, Carl Jung spoke a lot about the collective unconscious so um, art historians have now kind of found links between uh, those ideas and his creative process All right, Willem de Kooning. Um, although rooted in figuration, Kooning's work demonstrates the gestural abstract style. So uh, as you can see, uh, this is woman one, um, uh, a part of a series of women. And it is all over the place, again, garish practically very very avant-garde um, avant-garde and garish almost go hand in hand sometimes so he's got these really uh erratic sweeping gestural brush strokes um and you can just see the energy in the application of his pigment um so he was inspired by um um my brain just died. Um, he was inspired by uh, commercialism. That's the word. Um, so, and inspired, I, I guess I should use loosely because uh, he very much did not favor uh, commercialism. So the um, woman series was inspired by female models on billboards. So um, this this particular painting, if you look at that, um, that woman's smile, it was inspired by I think a Colgate. Uh, so like a tooth whitening toothpaste um, advertisement. And so it kind of starts as a smile that, that he based off of this advertisement and very, very quickly turns to this grimace. So um, that very clearly shows you what he kind of thought about the, um, you know, commodification, if that's even a word, of the world. Um, and despite the fact that it seems like um, this was hastily done. He spent two years on this particular painting. Um, he would go into his studio and he would paint and then he'd go home for the night and then the next day he would return and scrape all of the paint off and then start again. Um, pretty much until he was satisfied. Uh, there's an art, um, 
art critic, I believe, who would receive some of his paintings sometimes to put in galleries, to put in museums, and they would straight up have holes in the canvas because he was so rough with his materials. All right, Mark Rothko. This is fall, falling under chromatic abstractionist. Um, quite interesting pieces. Again, not everybody's cup of tea because people are wondering like, hey, what the heck is the deal with just, it's just two colors on a canvas and like the edges are kind of blurry. But um, it, it's fascinating. I, I've seen a uh, documentary on, on Rothko and people will straight up have religious experiences in front of these paintings. Um, I personally don't understand, but I personally have never seen them uh, in person. And that can honestly make all of the difference. So um, he believed that references to anything specific in the physical world conflicted with the sublime idea of the universal supernatural spirit of myth, which he saw as the core of meaning in his art. Um, so he wanted the focus on color to be the primary conveyor of meaning. Um, he insisted that color could express basic human emotions, tragedy, ecstasy, doom. The people who weep before my pictures are having the same religious experience I had when I painted them. And if you, as you say, are moved only by their color relationships, then you miss the point. Um, so that's very, very true of Rothko and his intentions. If you're saying like, oh, well, those colors look really, really nice together. I, I like the relationship between those colors. Then he absolutely believed that you missed the point. All right, pop art. Pop art is short for popular art. So um, I, for the longest time, uh, thought it was pop art because uh, called pop art because uh, um, of the way that a lot of Warhol's Andy Warhol's work, which is kind of like uh, like f visually pop, but popular art is is what that means. Um, so a lot of artists are perceiving that the avant garde alienated the public, and and they would be right. So they they sought to harness the communicative power of art to reach a wide audience, and this was. Um, based primarily on um, kind of the, the sensibilities and visual language of the late 20th century mass audience. Again, commercialism is growing like crazy. It has been since the industrial era, since Art Nouveau, <clears throat> since uh, toulouse lautre as we as we discussed him. Um, but it's it's gone way crazy out of hand with consumerism. So pop artists are trying to revive the tools that are traditionally used to convey meaning in art, which are signs, symbols, metaphors, illusions, illusions, and figural imagery. So we're returning back to figural representations of things. All right, this is a piece by Richard Hamilton. It's a collage. He took a bunch of um, uh, magazines, not newspapers, magazines. My brain was trying to tell me newspapers. Um, magazines and uh, very intricately cut out lots of things and collaged it all together. It's um, quite an extravagant title and I really love it. Just what is it that makes today's homes so different, so appealing? Um, really kind of funny. So um, the art historians trace the origins of pop art to a group of British artists, including Richard Hamilton. Um, he sought to initiate fresh thinking in art. Um, he had a fas fascination with the aesthetics and content um, of such facets of popular culture as advertising, comic books, and movies. So um, he created kind of this fantasy interior uh, to reflect the values of modern consumer culture um, through figures and objects that were cut from like these magazines. Um, he was toying a lot with a mass media imagery that typifies uh, British pop art. So um, they're 
pop artists are taking a lot of popular culture um, imagery and just kind of using it for their own commentary. <clears throat> Roy Lichtenstein, he's an um, American pop artist and quite a quite an interesting guy. He's he's pretty cool. Um, he turned his attention to commercial art focusing on comic books uh, because they were so prevalent in popular culture at that time. Um, he believed that parp parp pop artists <laughs> portray uh, what I think to be the most brazen and threatening characteristics of our culture, things we hate but which are also so powerful in their impingement, impingements on us. Um, he uh, says, uh, I paint directly uh, without perspective or shading. It doesn't look like a painting of something. It looks like the thing itself. Instead of looking like a painting of a billboard, pop art seems to be the actual thing. It's an intensification, a stylistic intensification of the excitement which the subject matter has for me. But the style is cool. One of the things a cartoon does is to express violent emotion and passion in a completely mechanized and removed style. To express this thing in painterly style would dilute it. Everybody has called pop art American painting, but it's actually industrial painting. Uh, America was hit by industrialism and capitalism harder and sooner. I think the meaning of my work is that it's industrial. It's what all the world will soon become. Europe will be the same way soon, so it won't be American. It will be universal. Um, and that's very, that's very striking. That that quote. I really love that quote because um, it's it's quite accurate. We're um, getting into a time in which art has become commercial and now c commercial has become art and um it's it's disposable and it, it it's kind of a crazy idea how how art has become so disposable with the exception of you know like what you see in um in, in museums that's less disposable but we see art literally everywhere so Lichtenstein really really caught on to that and um so he would take things that were meant to be very temporary, very fleeting, and immortalize them. Um, and he always remained faithful to the original images and used the visual vocabulary of the comic strip. So, uh, strip. so dark black outlines, unmodulated color areas, and Ben Day dots. So um, if you look really, really close at a comic book or um you know old funnies in the newspaper you would see this uh kind of modulation of dots they were only able to print in red yellow and blue um that's the ink colors that they had available at the time so they had to um break these colors up into different series of um dots that they altered in closeness and size in order to get a different value on their paper. So Lichtenstein um, took that and ran with it. All right, Andy Warhol, he's kind of the uh, prince of pop art. He's what everybody thinks of when they think of pop art. Um, he started his career as a commercial artist and illustrator, and that really kind of served him very well throughout the rest of his career as a um, celebrity artist. He um, famously selected icons of mass-produced consumer culture uh, just to repeat what consumer culture was doing to us as humans. We were being con constantly bashed over the head with these uh, with these images so he was just like you know uh, let them eat cake so he used a visual vocabulary and a printing technique that reinforced the images connections to consumer culture um, the repetition and redundancy reflect the omnipresence and dominance of a product in American society um, so much he was he was so into this idea of um, you know creating for consumerism and while critiquing consumerism and and all of those kind of philosophical uh ideas that he even named his studio the factory because what was he doing but you know 
recreating the same things that would be just mindlessly consumed. So he often created a lot of uh, imageries of images of celebrities, um, reinforcing their status as consumer products and commodities. So that was heavy, heavy commentary on what he thought of celebrities, that they were just reduced down to consumer products and commodities. They, they lost their, uh, their humanism. Um, that can be said a lot with um, all of the imagery he created on Marilyn Monroe um, because of her tragic life and death. She, she became this uh, consumer commodity. She became um, essentially less of a human. Um, so... I'm sorry, my brain just died. <laughs> so he kind of selected this publicity photo of um, of Marilyn Monroe uh, and thought that it really kind of did, like, it, it just did not provide any insight into the real Norma Jean Baker, who is, uh, you know, what Marilyn Monroe's name before she changed it into her persona. So, um Rather, the viewer just kind of sees this mask, the image that the the Hollywood myth machine created. So he's uh, clearly very bitter, <laughs> very bitter about it. He he uses this repetition of Monroe's face to reinforce her status as a commu uh, a consumer product. Um, her glamorous uh, kind of uh, features and visage are confronting the viewer over and over and over as it did in the American public in the aftermath of her death. It, it uh, is something that showed up everywhere. There was no way you could avoid it. All right. Super realism. Um, this is a super realist a statue by Dwayne Hansen. Um, he would take, uh, he would ask for, you know, people to pose as models and he would kind of like wrap them up in this uh, casting. He would do this casting method. So he'd cast real life people and then um, would fill fill the cast with polyester resin and then dress it up and stick a wig on it and, and make it and paint it and make it every as realistic as possible so um these are these are pretty fun and it's all they're also just so so hollow and empty and quite the um the critique on consumerism uh anyway super realism uh so like pop artists artists associated with super realism sought a form of artistic communication that was more accessible to the public than the uh expressionist kind of predecessors so they expanded uh pop art iconography by making images involving scrupulous fidelity to optical fact. It's also referred to as photorealism because a majority of the artists who were creating uh, super realism pieces were using photography as their base. Um, so again, that that conversation we had about photography, you either go uh, the opposite direction where, where you try and make things um, as unlike the photo as possible, or you go to super realism where you try and mimic it as much as possible. All right, Audrey Flack uh, was the pioneer of super realism. Um, she wasn't just kind of focusing on uh, making these technical exercises and capturing details of items, but um, she was making conceptual inquiries into the nature of photography. She recalled that um, as a student learning art history that she herself had only ever seen photos of art pieces and which is very true for for even us in this class we only ever see photos of art pieces which is um weird <laughs> um she says uh photography is my whole life i studied art history and it was always photographs i never saw the paintings they were in europe 
Look at TV and at magazines and reproductions. They're all influenced by photo vision. So that's all we see. We don't see the genuine artifact of of many things so the uh, the prevalence of photography during that day and age as well as this day and age um, really influenced and affected her work um, so she was trying to kind of explore the extent to which ph photography construction uh, constructs an understanding of reality so this piece of hers is a uh, tribute to Marilyn Monroe um, it's kind of a it, it's a very different tribute to that of um, Warhols. Um, it's kind of almost like a, a memorial piece as opposed to like kind of this bitter uh, representation of Marilyn as this consumer product. All right, feminist art. Um, in the 1970s, the feminist movement focused uh, public attention on the history of women and their place in society. So um, there's lots of crazy feminism stuff going on. People are burning their bras in the streets, and so it's showing up in art. Um, so Judy Chicago and Miriam Shapiro are the, um, you know, like at the forefront of the feminist art movement. Um, Judy Chicago and a group of students at our very own Cal State University Fresno uh, founded the feminist art program where teachers and students came together to create major feminist pieces. Um, one of them being the, uh, uh, an image of which you see behind this slide uh, is called a uh, heck what was it called uh woman woman house i think yeah woman house literally called woman house all right um so and you can see the various repetition of breasts just kind of hanging from the walls back there so that that kind of shows you what you're in for when it comes to feminist art there's uh lots of representations of um of female anatomy just to kind of put it out there and put it in your face because male anatomy has been um focused on phalluses and such in art history for uh, thousands of years. All right, so Ju something that Judy Chicago created is the dinner party, and um, it's a fascinating piece. Uh, she wanted to educate people about women's role in history and the fine arts, um, and she's trying to establish respect for women and their, their art. So in this piece, she utilized crafting techniques that were traditionally practiced by women. And it's, um, it was originally idealized, uh, or um, that's not the right word. She, she conceptualized it as um, the Last Supper but with entirely women. Um, so, uh, so she had this idea of, okay, I'll have 13 placeholders. Um, and 13 is also a witchcraft number. That's how many uh, uh, women you have in a coven. Um, which ref which worships the, the mother goddess. So there was all sorts of, of kind of layering of ideas in this piece. Um, as well as the very obvious um, chalice representation in all of the plates. So um, the, the female anatomy, the, the, the vaginal representation in all of the plates. Um, the concept grew from, from 13 place markers to 39 place markers as Chicago started doing extensive research on all of the women who affected... Um, uh, history so dramatically and then underneath on all of those tiles there's 999 women's names that also affected history um, to a little bit of a lesser extent um, than the ones represented in the placeholders but still to quite an extent all right Miriam Shapiro um, became pretty fascinated in um, the hidden metaphors for womanhood that she found in her uh, abstract painting. She was an abstract painter up until uh, she kind of helped founded uh, the feminist movement. 
And so she began making these huge kind of sewn collages with this, uh, again, this kind of bitter and satirical um, uh, appreciation and, and uh, approach to them. She called them fomages as opposed to collages uh, to make the point that women had been doing these kinds of collages with these kinds of materials long before Pablo Picasso introduced collage to the art world. Um, my cat is attacking me right now, so give me a hot second. No, get out of here. Why are you so rude right now? Oh my god. Okay, everything's fine. <laughs> everything's fine. All right, anyway, sorry about that. Okay, so um, this is a piece that I just uh, think is pretty funny, pretty enjoyable. There were a group of women in the 1980s, I'm going to say, and I'm going to be right, yeah, <laughs> in the 1980s that they called themselves the Gorilla Girls. Um they have taken the world of the woman artist as their subject rather than woman in society at large. So uh, they're focusing specifically on being a woman artist. Um, they kind of build themselves as the conscience of the art world. Uh, this group saw its duty as uh, calling attention to the injustice in the art world, especially what it perceived as the sexist and racist orientation of the major art institutions. So uh, they were there to speak out and say what they wanted to say. Uh, to protect their identities, they would wear gorilla masks in public and um, they would employ gorilla, so, or I suppose technically it's pronounced gorilla, so gorilla uh, tactics by demonstrating in public, uh, putting on performances, and placing posters and flyers in public locations. Uh, this is one of those posters, and it's pretty, pretty comical. Um, it says, the advantages of being a woman artist working without the pressure of success, not having to be in shows with men, having an escape from the art, wor art world in your four freelance jobs, knowing your career might pick up after you're 80, being reassured that whatever kind of art you make, it will be labeled feminine, not being stuck in a tenured teacher p teaching position, seeing your ideas live on in the work of others and a number of other pretty negative things so um again relatively comical also very true all right we're getting towards the end here um we're going to talk just a little bit about environmental and site specific art this stuff is kind of um sometimes called earthworks uh, excuse me, I have to cough just a hot second. Hopefully the muting of my mic just worked right there. Okay, so um, the this art category exists at the intersection of architecture and sculpture. Um, it was pretty far removed from the typical drawing and painting that we're used to seeing in um, most of the art worlds. These are really large scale pro uh, projects. Uh, a lot of artists were focusing on using natural or organic materials, including the land itself. Um, this is a time in which the um, environment is suffering and suffering hard. So. Uh, there were a lot of artists at the forefront of fighting to protect our environment and protect what um, industrialism and consumerism had destroyed. Um, some, some artists, of course, did not use uh, completely organic materials, but not all of these pieces were meant to stay up for, you know, dozens of years so they would take down and make sure they cleaned up the area and be as um, environmentally responsible as possible. Uh, they wanted to uh, call attention to the landscape that was suffering so much um, so they decided to start creating really beautiful things so people would start paying attention to the earth beneath their very feet. Um, 
It started to challenge traditional assumptions about art and art models and insisted on moving art out of the rarefied atmosphere of museums and galleries and into the public sphere. So we're increasingly try trying to make art more accessible to the masses. Um, this is something that was uh, an ideal uh, couple hundred years ago and has just kind of uh, grown from there. And I would say we we have pretty good access to art nowadays, but not all of it's considered fine art. All right, so this is the Spiral Jetty by Robert Smithson. Um, he used industrial equipment to create uh, environmental artworks by manipulating earth and rock. Um, it's the so spiral jetty is this uh, coil of black basalt limestone and earth extending into the Great Salt Lake in Utah. Um, this piece was something that he created out of inspiration um, from his first impression of the location um, when um, he. Uh, visited he he was driving by the lake one day uh smithson came across some abandoned mining equipment um it was left there by a company that had tried and failed to extract oil from the site and so smithson saw this as kind of this testament to the enduring power of nature and to uh humankind's inability to conquer it so it was kind of like a tribute to the to the fact that heck yeah earth won nice and um when um he was researching the great salt lake smithson discovered that the molecular structure of the salt crystals coating the rocks at the water's edge was uh this spiral form so he used uh this as again a tribute to the the very earth that humans had failed to conquer. All right, these are the surrounded islands. These were up in um, the Bisca Bisca Biscayne, Biscayne Bay in Miami, Florida. All right, I did that. Um, from 1980 to 1983, again, these weren't up for like crazy long period of time not many earthworks are with the exception of course the of the the spiral jetty it's still hanging out i mean sometimes because of the way that the um water happens that's a word the water happens in um the salt lakes um it is sometimes underwater for for long periods of time so you can't even really see it but um anyway I digress. So these are the surrounded islands. And so they were they were trying to I, intensify the viewer's awareness of the space and features of rural and urban sites. Um, so but instead of like physically altering the land itself, uh, Smithson off as Smithson did, um, Christo and Jean Claude prompted this awareness by temporarily modifying the landscape with cloth. So um, again, not an organic material, technically not biodegradable. Um, I suppose depending on what kind of cloth it was, it would have been fine. But <clears throat> it is something that they put up and then later did take down. All right, last slide here. Um, I don't have any examples of these ones, um, but if there, it's something you're really interested in looking at, um, YouTube is honestly a really phenomenal place for um, for all of these um, because a lot of these kind of have to do with uh, video, um, especially new media. So performance art uh, started... Uh, it, it replaced traditional stationary art movements with uh, or start stationary art with movements, gestures, and sounds carried out before an audience whose members may or may not participate. Um, the performance art also really goes hand in hand with new media because of the ability to uh, easily record video. <coughs> Um, so the only surviving evidence of performance art is typically video or phot photography taken at the time of it occurring. Um, so 
it's an interesting art form because it's again so fleeting and and these artists are focusing uh very heavily on um the the fleeting nature of the art uh next is conceptual art which is truthfully a lot of fun um so the artfulness of the art is uh in the artist's idea rather than the execution or final expression of the idea so um art is now just ideas um it, it, getting real crazy getting real crazy with this art so um there's this uh i guess i should have put this picture in here i guess you can look it up it's it's called three chairs oh no one and three chairs um by joseph kosuth and it's a uh, picture of a wooden folding chair next to the actual wooden folding folding chair next to a panel that has the word chair defined on it um so nothing about that is artful just nothing about it <laughs> um however the idea is pretty cool it's so like wow yeah that's pretty nice it's like this uh um there's this piece by duchamp it's a ready-made it's a uh snow shovel it's a snow shovel and he just kind of hung it from the ceiling in a gallery and he called it um uh before the broken arm which is pretty hysterical it's pretty funny um anyway new media so um Modern avant-garde artists are really heavily embracing new and emerging media. So video and computer graphics were and still are favored among artists. Um, you can find lots of crazy, wonderful, wonderful art out there in video art and uh, with computer graphics. All right, that is that. Um, I don't know exactly how long that went. It felt really crazy long for me. Um, but that is it. That's the end of this unit and the end of our second semester together. So um, I hope you enjoy or enjoyed your um, art museum trip. I'll be able to read that essay when you get back. And um, I'll see you around campus. <laughs>